I wanted to ask you about how you approach self-knowledge. How do you investigate uh, kind of yourself and and your beliefs? Um, and you've mentioned ident identity before. Do you have any specific practices? Um, do they change with time or do you kind of have your go-to practices? Can you talk about that a bit? Um, for me, it's just lots and lots and lots of writing in my journal. Um, I just do everything in just text files. So I just, I type really fast and free and some people enjoy longhand, but to me, I, um, every day, uh, almost every day, I open up a text file and at first I just dump out whatever's on my mind right now. But then I like to um, skeptically challenge everything I just said as a fact. And so if I said like such and such is a bad idea, then I'll kind of go back and add a question mark to it. Like, is it a bad idea? Why is it a bad idea? What if it's not a bad idea? What would it look like? Like I just, I like to do the, the skeptic thing of um, doubting everything I, I've, I think I hold true try doubting it, see how that looks. What if it were false? What is the opposite? What if? What are the other possibilities here? And then there's always the idea of pushing past, past the first few possibilities. Like we often think in terms of um, two choices. We often think in terms of choices, but once we get to two choices, we say, okay, well now I have to decide between these two choices. And it's like, no, okay, no, never, never stop at two choices. You can always add more. There's always the choice of do nothing, go crazy, you know, um, there's always more choices. And then you could start to look at a, a spectrum of choices. So self-knowledge, um, yeah, I just do this kind of stuff every day. Um, I just put aside time. I guess it helps that like, I don't, I don't do a lot of stuff that normal people do. I don't watch videos of any sort. I don't, I just generally don't watch things. Just almost any moment I'm awake, I'm, I'm writing or talking or reading and that's it. I don't watch things. Um, I don't hang out. I don't like sit on couches and <laughs> you know, that kind of stuff. So I, I guess the, the, if it seems like I'm, I'm weird in the stuff that I do, it, it's just time that maybe normal people would spend uh, watching things. I tend to spend writing. Hmm. I'm, I'm curious how your ideas about minimalism and, and, your, your philosophies for living have changed once you had your, your child. Ah, um, can you see the, uh, the Lego back there on the table? Um, so, uh, yeah, when he was up until he was about two years old, um, I kind of held my minimalist philosophies applied to parenting. He had no toys. Um, we would go outside and play with sticks or rocks or whatever, and that's it. And then when he was like, yeah, he was two years old when I, we were living in New Zealand and I went to a cafe uh, in Masterton that had a huge box of toys and he saw this box of toys and he just sat there and played with everything for three hours. Like I didn't interrupt him. I just sat there for three hours, just kind of ordering a second and a third cup of tea and just watching him play for three hours. Like, oh my God, he's in heaven. And um, it's like, okay, I've, I've made a mistake. <laughs> he needs toys. Like, this is clear. So uh, that night I went on to eBay and found somebody in Wellington where I was living that was um, giving away like three or four huge boxes just filled with toys for like $10. And I was like, okay, I, I took it and just presented him with four giant bins of toys. And for the next um, <clears throat> five years until we moved here, um, he just played with that giant box of toys like every single day, never got tired of it. So um, yeah, that was a good lesson that um, kind of like the beginning when you asked me about hell yeah or no, that's a certain tool for a certain situation. Minimalism is a certain tool for a certain kind of desire, for a certain kind of situation. It's not the answer to everything. So we should, you know, question all of these isms, <laughs> including that one. But um, yeah, they're, they're tools. We don't need to think that 
just because something is true for us now that it is true for everything, it's the answer. It's like, no, it's just, it's just a tool for now. So, um, yeah, I, I don't apply most of, most of what works for me in my life. I don't apply to his life. I don't try to push it on him because I know that it's not what he needs. You know, this conversation of, of state versus um, process has been coming up a ton lately in the last few weeks for us. And I'm recognizing as you're talking that this is actually something you're doing too. You seem to be deeply committed to processes, but the process of, of changing processes and, and using processes to uncover what's working and what's not. And you, you seem extremely, to use your words, disloyal to states. You're not trying to get something, be something, you know, have a check mark on a to-do list. Like you're not looking at states at all. I think, um, you know, we talk about commonly known spectrums like introvert versus extrovert. Um, but there are all these other ones too. Like I remember reading once that there's a, a spectrum of how much we tend to find similarities versus find differences. Like that's something that there's a spectrum and they have some kind of name for it in psychology that they can measure it. They, they can ask you some questions and mm -hmm. say, oh, you're a similarity finder or you're a difference finder. And I read that one of these uh, spectrums is being process focused versus goal focused. Mm. And the cliche of the person that is process focused is doing something almost to completion and then going, that's enough. <laughs> like I was doing it for the doing, not for the end result. Mm. And so, yeah, I remember years ago when I took one of those tests, like that was, that was totally me. I will very often do something almost to completion. Then I'll feel like, yeah, I got, I got, I got the benefit I wanted. I was doing it for the doing. I didn't really care whether I got to the finish line or not. Um, <laughs> yeah, I would say that, that would, that would be kind of a, a, a fun little skit about like the, um, the process focused person running a marathon and then right before you get to the finish line, uh, just walking off, like just like literally <laughs> two feet before the finish line, just going like, I'm done. That's cool. I'm just like, I don't need to cross it. I was just doing it for the running. Um, Especially if they yeah. were first, that'd be really hilarious. <laughs> right, right. Nah, good enough. Yeah, that's, um, that's gotta be the 26th and seventh lesson in your book. Never right, complete right. anything, <laughs> <laughs> never conclude and always conclude. Well, there was, um, yeah, one of them is about reinvention and it is kind of like that. It's saying that, that we always, it's beginner's mind. It's, it's when you're with your beginner's mind, when you're new to something, that's when you make the best progress. That's when you get all the new insights and all that kind of stuff. So living in the name of reinvention, you're all, you stay a beginner at everything. And as soon as you get to be enough of an expert, time to reinvent, pick something completely different and do it again. But, um, Cool. Yeah. Wait, uh, I think I was just going to make another joke about the marathon. Uh, oh, I know what it was. When I was living in Singapore, I was living in this building that was right above, um, it was like right above like the Central Park kind of thing in Singapore. It was Marina Bay. Um, and that's where they would do all of like the marathons and the races and the triathlons would always begin like right below my window. So very often, at like 6 a.m. on a Sunday, I'd be woken up with like, and, like <laughs> and um, I just look out the window at like all these people, like organizers with clipboards and everybody with the numbers on. And I just think, you know, you could have run the same 10 miles yesterday just by yourself. Like, <laughs> In the why, woods. <laughs> yeah, why would you choose all of this noise and screaming and commotion and the numbers and the clipboards and the walkie-talkies? Why would you, why not just do the run yesterday? And I said this to somebody who looked at me and said, you know, some people like being around other people. <laughs> went, oh, right. Yeah, that, that's my introvert thing. <laughs> like, everything's better alone. Yeah, anyway. <laughs> And some people like structure yeah. and organization. And the the, that's mm -hmm. the, the goal-focused versus process-focused. Is If you're goal-focused, then it's like really important to you that it's like, I did the marathon. I was number 37 and I came in, whatever, 19th place of that marathon. It's like really important. The, yeah, goal-focused people want to show that they achieved that goal. And it like, the, you know, there was a guy that beat the world record uh, 
ran the marathon in under two hours just uh, last week or something. But they say that it doesn't officially count because he did it by himself. Like he did it, he had tra uh, pacers running with him, um, but because it wasn't an official marathon that had other contestants, it doesn't count for some reason. What? So, yeah, he did it anyway, but it's like because there, it wasn't a competitive official marathon, and, and he knew that. He said, well, I'm, I'm doing it anyway just to show that in ideal situations, a marathon can be run in under two hours. We've proved it now. And so I hope others will now, you know, like once, once Roger Bannister broke the four minute mile, like 10 other people did it the following year, even though it had never been done up until then. So he said, I'm doing it for that reason. You can tell me it wasn't official. It doesn't matter to me. Huh. Metaphors. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's uh, just the kind of thread of this conversation. It's interesting that uh, life and living things, just there's such a variety and that there are so many different ways that living beings can thrive, you know? Like some, some creatures are, you know, more adapted to a certain niche and there's maybe less variety, at least within the species, but then there's another species living somewhere else that's doing something totally different, you know, like different kinds of finches or whatever. Um, but humans are fascinating in the sense that we are so versatile. There are just so many different, you know, modes of being that can make people happy and fulfilled. Um, and, and even in your book, you know, about how, how to live, you're presenting so many different kind of ways that, or pathways that people can take. And even just that realization, I think, I think is really interesting for people to ponder, um, especially if they're feeling stuck, you know, like there are just a million different paths and the one that you're on right now may not be optimal for you. Or that's you might have, okay. you know, been there, done that already. I think that's what's really helpful about um, the four-hour workweek book inspired a lot of people because Tim was writing about um, here's a different way you could approach life, you know, whether it's the, um, the mini, what do you call it, mini retirements or just like even tiny stories about the family that sold their house and traveled the world on a sailboat for an entire year. And the total cost to live on a boat for a whole year and travel the, sail the world was $18,000. Just even, even just hearing that something like that is a possibility makes you go, whoa, like, is that what I want? I could do that. And even just knowing that you could makes you question, do I want to or not? I kind of want to. Do I want to badly enough to give up this house? Uh, maybe not. Maybe therefore, I actually value comfort more than sailing. I just, yeah, these things make you uh, question your values. Um, but yeah, it's, it's always wonderful to be presented with other options. That's what um, explorers do for us, right? So say 200 years ago, um, we, there were parts, there were places on the map that we just really didn't know what was there yet. And so explorers, were thought of as like physical explorers, you know, they, they, with the, the, the hat and the little thing, and they'd go off into the darkest Peru and explore places that hadn't been explored yet. And then they'd come back and draw the maps and report to us about what's there. But now that we know what's everywhere physically in the world, I think we still need explorers that are like life explorers, to like go explore what can be done with a life and show it to us you know, show us places on the, the map of possibilities that we haven't, that we didn't know were there. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, yeah, I think that's a place to wrap up. Yeah, good place to wrap up. It was really surprising to me how many parallels in this conversation ha there have been to so many of the areas we found ourselves talking about, the sense making, the sovereignty, the shadow work, stoicism, all of this stuff. And it's just like, just you it's really cool to see someone really in a different way, a, a, a different kind of place in life, coming to a lot of the same conclusions that's from their I own like reflections. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's, you know, I, uh, I've done basically no interviews for the last almost four years now. And um, 
yeah, when when you guys asked, even you know, even I said it on my blog recently, like, well, I'm starting to feel open to the idea. So people started asking, and I still kept saying no. <laughs> like, I got uh, you guys asked, and I was like, yeah, okay. yeah, all right, you guys are cool. <laughs> that was weird. We're gonna have a good conversation. Yeah, and I like, I love this conversation. So thank you. Cool. Yeah. yeah thank you too. It was awesome to. Um... To finally get that yes <laughs> to talk to you yeah it's it's um it's i don't know how to put it into words but you're weird <laughs> that's Thank it's, you. it's cool the ultimate um, compliment <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's yeah. it's um like the way that you phrase things and the way that you do things is just very in some ways very counter to how other people do things. Um, but you seem to have so much joy about it, you know? Like it, you're stoked about it and you're just like, yeah, <laughs> trying these things. I don't know, there's just, it's the tone of this interview was really different than a lot of our other interviews. And I like that. Yeah. 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 <laughs> cool. So cool. Yeah, thank you for your time. <laughs> Thanks. And yeah, anybody uh, who listened all the way to the end, go to my site at sivers.org and send me an email and say hello. I still reply to every email and I enjoy it. I like hearing from strangers around the world. It's fun. Cool. Cool. Awesome. awesome. The brand new Future Thinkers members portal is now live. Develop your sovereignty and self-knowledge with our in-depth courses. Get access to our weekly sense-making calls. Join the Q&As with past podcast guests and much more. Become a Future Thinkers member today at futurethinkers.org slash members. To stay up to date with new episodes, subscribe to Future Thinkers on your favorite platform. And leave us a review or a like. It really helps out the show. And don't forget to share this episode on social media. Enter the Future Thinkers giveaway and win our brand new community membership, including in-depth courses, private calls, and more, as well as a supply of Qualia, a complete cognitive upgrade for your brain. To enter the contest, simply go to futurethinkers.org slash giveaway and sign up for our mailing list to instantly get our 50-page guide on how to adapt to the future. There are many ways to increase your chances of winning. Enter the competition today. This episode is brought to you by Qualia, a nootropic supplement that helps support mental performance and mood. To get 10% off, use the code FUTURE at checkout. And to learn more about neurohacking, visit futurethinkers.org neuro.